Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. It's my pleasure to be here and hope I can do justice to the panel we have today with, with my moderation of it. Um, I'd like to introduce the panel and then uh, talk about someone who would have joined us but couldn't uh, from Washington, D.C., but has uh, sent us a, a little video message. Our panel today is Kate Trumbull. Uh, Kate is an attorney and vice president uh, for federal policy at Results for America in Washington, D.C. Uh, she previously served as the pastoral associate for social justice at Holy Trinity Catholic Church in Washington. Prior to that, Kate served as Director of Legislative Affairs at the Education Trust, a nonprofit policy and advocacy organization that seeks to eliminate the academic achievement gaps that separate low-income students and students of color from their peers. Our second panelist today is Greg Kiesling. Greg is a native Hoosier, and he's the founder and president of Recycle Force. It's a social enterprise here in Indianapolis that employs formerly incarcerated individuals in electronic waste recycling. Uh, we call that a twofer. Greg has led Recycle Force for more than 15 years, and he has provided thousands of formerly incarcerated men and women with workplace training, certifications, counseling, and meaningful transitional employment. Our final panelist today is Leslie Wagner. Leslie is a senior principal with Genovis in Fishers, Indiana. They provide modeling, site selection, and economic development incentive procurement assistance to clients. Leslie has 25 plus years of experience and her client work includes new facility development, expansion, consolidation, and relocation of Fortune 500, life sciences, manufacturing, distribution, and information technology businesses. Leslie has successfully closed transactions resulting in over $1.3 billion of capital investment and more than 13,500 new jobs. Uh, prior to her career with Genovis, Leslie worked at the Indiana Economic Development Corporation. And uh, those are our live panelists today. Uh, we have a special message from someone who could not be with us today. We've had a bit of technical difficulty on the sound, but right now I hope we will hear and see Congresswoman Jackie Walorski from Indiana's 2nd Congressional District. Good afternoon. I'm Congresswoman Jackie Walorski. Thank you to Greg, Kate, and Larry for being on this panel today to give their insights and to Cameron for moderating. I am so excited to help kick off what I hope will be an informative, engaging, and useful conversation ahead of Organization Day at the State House. As we all know well, our nation continues to deal with an unprecedented public health and economic crisis. But Americans are resilient, innovative, and determined, and I have every confidence we will emerge from this even stronger than we were before. Since 2006, Recycle Force has made a real difference in our state. It provides opportunities, job training, and support services to formerly incarcerated men and women in preparation for their transition to full-time employment. And it has safely recycled more than 65 million pounds of electronic waste. The evidence shows it works. The Department of Labor's Enhanced Transitional Jobs Demonstration Study found the program reduced participant recidivism by 6.2 percentage points and increased wages by more than $5,800. The benefits certainly outweigh the cost of the program, and state and local governments across Indiana and the country can look to Recycle Force as an outstanding example of what is possible. I look forward to the amazing things that lie ahead for Recycle Force and its participants. I hope this discussion provides even more insight into how transitional programs like this are helpful to not only the previously incarcerated individuals and their families, but also to the state as a whole. Well, we want to thank Congresswoman Walorski for providing that uh, wonderful testimonial to us. Uh, with that, we're going to start our program with just a few opening remarks from each of our panelists. We'll start uh, with Kate Trombell, also from Washington, D.C. Uh, again, Kate is Vice President for Federal Policy at Results for America. Uh, Kate, I would call that organization, from what I've learned about it, um, as an organ a nonprofit that's dedicated to telling government and other organizations what public policies and governmental programs 
uh, work and what don't. Uh, very much dedicated to data-driven decision-making. I hope that does your organization justice and I'll uh, open the floor for you. Thank you, Cam. That was an actually an excellent uh, description of what Results for America does. We don't just tell uh, governments, we try actually to work with them at the federal, state and local level to help them identify um, interventions, programs, what's working, right? And then to, to fund those and, and put them in place. So today, Greg and folks at Recycleforce asked me to come talk about subsidized employment, um, which I thought I wanted to start with that term because I think it's not quite the right term. So we're not talking about it. Sort of subsidized employment thinks big, it thinks it sounds expensive, it thinks, you know, make work kind of programs. What we're really talking about here are career pathways. And that's a term you might know um, from the K-12 or post-secondary world where we help young people integrate school and work experiences to give them a clear path towards um, a job and a career that they want in a particular field. And that's generally aligned you know, whether it's through starting in high school through community college to four year college and into career. And what we're talking about today is the same thing, but it's a career pathway for folks who have barriers to employment. Uh, I understand in Indiana, you might talk about it as the ABCs of employment. And I think that's a really great way to think about it. Any job, a better job and a career. Um, and we're talking about that for folks who, as I mentioned, have barriers to employment. So when we mention barriers, we're thinking formerly incarcerated individuals, which is who Recycle Force works with. Other employment social enterprise transitional job providers work with homeless or opportunity youth who are connected somehow to uh, the child welfare or juvenile justice system. But it's essentially folks who don't have a work history uh, or maybe haven't held a job at any point or for very long. Um, so that's kind of the, the, what we're talking about and the folks that it works with. And another thing to know about these kind of programs, these you know, ABC employment programs, um, is that they often work best in an economic downturn. And the reason for that is that's the period where it's hardest for folks to find a job because uh, employers don't have the same kind of resources or they to support employees, or they may be in a position where they're having to, to let employees go. But they need, they still need the employees, it just aren't the same sort of resources. So um, at the moment, it might be a good, is sort of a prime time to be talking about uh, these ABCs in employment, this career pathway. Um, so how does it work? The first is the any job piece, the A piece, and that's a transitional job. Uh, that's what Recycle Force and other similar employment social enterprises do. They help folks who've been formerly incarcerated, who are homeless or opportunity youth, get a job. Um, and because what's important at that person's point in life is not just the job, it is the job, but it's also other things. It's stabilizing their life, um, whether it's housing, whether it's getting a credential, whether it's checking with a probation officer. This is the kind of time in a, a person without any job experience or, or history's life where it's really expensive to train them, right? They, they, yes, need to show up. They need to learn how to come every day, but they also need these other supports, whether they're mental health, whether they're, again, checking with probation officer, whether they're just social, emotional. And it's not necessarily in a for-profit business's interest um, to hire them because there's a lot of other things going on. They need, they need those extra supports. So it's a perfect time for a nonprofit that also runs a business to step in. And that's what the folks at employment social enterprise, enterprises like Recycle Force do. They get the job, but they also provide the sport, the supports. They get a person stabilized, and then they sort of punt them, hopefully, to the next stage, which is the a better job. And that's the place also where there's a little bit of subsidy. So folks who leave that that first transitional job experience, they need one that doesn't come with quite so many supports but they're probably not ready yet to be your completely reliable employee. There's maybe still some checking in, some, some stabilizing that's helping, but they are in a better position to be, to be working um, on their own. And so they need a little bit of employers are more likely to hire them, but maybe still need a little bit to sweeten the pot. And that's where some federal or state or even local dollars can come in. So an employer can say pay for 50% of the person's time and have some public dollars pay for say 50% of the time. Um, that makes it a little bit, it takes the risk off of hiring that person a little bit. But again, you're getting a person who's already been through a transitional job, who's got some training or acquired a credential. So they are ready. They just have other things going on that maybe it's helpful to a, 
benefit to an employer to have a little bit of insurance around them. Um, and then the third spot, that career, right? If you get through that transitional job and into the subsidized job, the real key about that subsidized job is it is time limited, right? We don't want it to go on forever, maybe 18 months at the most. Um, and then the idea is at the end of those 18 months, the person is ready to be a quality employee for an employer for a long time. So it's, you know, thinking about sort of a, it's a sort of a hand up, right? It's that short term, some public dollars to take the risk away, to provide a little insurance. And then the employer hires the person on as hopefully at this point, uh, a long-term employee who is, is really quite valuable and has the skills and training necessary to advance the employer's um, business. So that's the, the three parts of it. Um, and the other piece I should probably put a little bit of a finer point on is that the idea of these subsidized or transitional jobs, career pathway, however you want to think about it, is that the folks they're working with are going to be coming back to your community anyways, right? They are sort of a community betterment. Folks who are being released from prison and returning to community are going to be there. These programs help them be there as a more useful part of this community. They help get a job, they help stabilize them, uh, and it helps the employer, it helps the community, um, hopefully to, to increase economic mobility all around. Um, so that's kind of what it is. The question we next ask ourselves is why should we do it? I'm you know, giving you some ideas, but, but, but what else? The number one of that is that research shows it works. Um, as I think uh, Congresswoman Walorski alluded to at the beginning in her introduction, there was a, a large, the largest evaluation that's been done of these programs is the Enhanced Transitional Jobs Demonstration Program. And it evaluated 13 transitional job programs across the country with an organization called MDRC, that was the evaluator. And they found that all of the programs enhanced earnings one year after, and then can most continued to enhance people's earnings two years after completion. So they got people to a place where they were making um, more and contributing more to their, their community. They also found that programs that used a traditional transitional job model like Recycle Force does, where you are in a job as well as um, having supports and training at the same time. They had higher participation rates, uh, larger employment and earning impacts through the first two years of employment. And then the third finding was that the programs that focused on, on preventing recidivism actually did present, prevent recidivism. I think Recycle Forces, it showed present, prevented it by 6.2 percentage points more uh, than, than otherwise would have been. So taking all that together, the last and final finding of that study was that the costs of the program were outweighed by the benefits of the program, both through reduced recidivism, more stabilized housing, and employment and earnings um, for the individuals. That's the largest study that's been done. Uh, they've also, there are a couple others. Um, MDRC, that same evaluator, did a program looking just at an organization called the Council for Economic Opportunity. Uh, which is a similar employment social enterprise. And they um, run a number of programs across the country and found that they similarly reduced recidivism for all of their programs and generated about $1.25 to about $3.85 in benefits for every dollar that was invested in the program. Um, then there are a couple others, a Mathematica study and a study um, by an organization called Rediff. And both of those similarly found increase in, in wages uh, and in a decrease in recidivism for those kinds of organizations. So um, evidence shows it works. There's more evaluation that needs to be done. Most of these evaluations were done in sort of good economic times. So, uh, and at the and we're short term, we have short term findings because they just sort of started the evaluation. And now it would be important to continue looking at that both in an, the, sort of the current downturn and as the programs go further along to continuing to have, are they still working? And what are we learning about them and driving it back in to the programs? But, but the evidence to this point has been very positive. The other reason to do it is that it, there are states around you that are doing it. So Wisconsin is a really great example of a statewide transitional jobs program. I think some folks from Indiana actually helped set up the, or maybe working now in Indiana actually helped set up the Wisconsin program. And it's been around since two 2013. In Indiana, excuse me, in Wisconsin, it's part of the Rural Poverty Initiative and it provides limited term work for or technical training 
to low income individuals. They do it both in urban settings and in rural settings and the program looks a little different in each place, but it has been proven to be uh, successful in Wisconsin. Um, Colorado has more recently created a program, they call it Rehire Colorado, but they are doing a similar um, statewide transitional jobs program. Okay, and then because I'm rattling on too long, let me go one more thing, which is the last reason to do it is there might be money to help fund it. Um, there's a program in the federal government called the Social Impact Partnerships to Pay for Results. You probably all know it as CIPRA. Um, it is $100 million uh, in competitive grants that can fund innovative responses to social issues. Um, and one of their nine, excuse me, eight, eight organizations, eight applicants have gotten grants uh, or have moved to the finals for grants. And India Anna actually is one of those eight. Uh, it received a potential, it's gonna potentially receive a grant for expanding its nurse family partnership home visiting program. And the reason that uh, Indiana was able to do that was because it had that program already set up, right? It already was working with Nurse Family Partnership. It already had home visiting. And so there is a potential large amount of dollars to help that program expand within the state. If there had been a transitional jobs program set up across the state, it would have been able to apply for there and potentially have gotten a jobs, excuse me, a large number of federal dollars to help support that program's expansion. Uh, there also could be dollars in a recovery package. There will be employment dollars, whether that package is passed by the end of the year in the, in the current Congress or, um, or another Congress starting in January. There, there is ultimately going to be another CARES Act, another, another recovery stimulus package coming out of the federal government, and there will definitely be dollars for, edu for employment in there, and there will be dollars for transitional employment. So if there was a program existing or, or getting off the ground in Indiana, that would be another opportunity to help get some funding to support that so the state doesn't have to fund it in, entirely. And then the last piece is there's a bill floating around the Senate by uh, Senator Tammy Baldwin from Wisconsin that is a um, creates a grant program within the federal government, within the Department of Labor that would fund statewide subsidized and transitional jobs programs. So that, that bill will be reintroduced. And again, if there were a program in Indiana, there'd be an opportunity to take advantage of some federal dollars. Um, so I think that's it. You have really great evidence champions in Indiana. You saw Congresswoman Wolorski. Um, Senator Todd Young is another incredible champion that we have the fortune to work with. And I think they would be federal folks that could help if something like this was created, if a transitional jobs program got off the ground um, more than just in one community, you'd have folks in Washington who would be helpful as champions to, to move those programs along. So Cam, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you, Kate. So if, if I heard you correctly, very, very quickly, um, recidivism goes down with this transitional jobs programs, wages go up, it passes the cost benefit analysis test. And if a, a state or polity has a program in place, you're more likely to get a competitive grant uh, from the federal government versus not having it. And I guess in the case of, of Recycle Force, you get, a, you get another one there and you're taking care of the environment and electronic waste. And with that, I'll turn it over to Greg Kiesling to talk a little bit about uh, his firsthand experience with uh, running this social uh, enterprise. Thanks, Cam, and thanks, Kate, for a really good background of setting this up. Um, you know, Recycle Force is a social enterprise. Uh, we recycle old electronics and a large amount of metals, but we also recycle lives. We remake these things into something society wants. We feed, you know, as an example, we provide uh, support about 30 plus jobs in the Indiana steel industry where our recycled steel is made into rebar. But as importantly, we're recycling it, men and women back into civil society so that they can become parents, productive citizens and productive taxpayers and not a burden on the jail and prison costs in our state. So the, I like to say, and this is a growing term that we're using across the country, we're not just in a social enterprise, we're in an employment social enterprise. We have a transitional jobs program embedded into our model that brings people in for 120 to a days, four to six months, helps them stabilize with their oversight, 
Uh, in Marion County on any given day, there's 14 to 15,000 people, that's Indianapolis, under criminal justice oversight who have to pay fines and fees, they have to report, they have to do random drug testing. So we designed the employment model so individuals coming in can adhere to the oversight but still have a chance to work. I think one of our guys framed it well, often when you get out of prison, you have to decide if I'm gonna work and not really better myself or try to better myself and not work. And what we're doing here is combining both of those into one thing. Uh, Recycle Force has been primarily funded by federal grants. Uh, the enhanced transitional job demonstration that Congresswoman uh, Walorski spoke about was our big moment uh, to really put our model to the test. A thousand people came out of the Indiana Department of Correction Half of them were randomized into the Recycle Force Transitional Jobs Program. The other 500 sought services in the community as usually provided. And I'm very proud, it, you've heard the numbers that have been laid out, but we were the, one of the very few in the country that had impacts that resulted in a um, return on investment study. So I'm proud to say we returned $1.20 for every dollar that was invested in us. And our cost, it, many of the other programs were not running businesses. Our cost also included the cost of running the business, the unique costs that come out uh, that we generated from our own revenue uh, from the sale of our recycled material. So uh, I'm very happy that Kate talked about the ABC model. We're very proud of that. Uh, my colleague Tom Moore started this uh, many, many years ago when we began to talk about how can we bring people home from prison and jail and stair-step them back into civil society. It's not a magic uh, pathway. So we're happy that it, we're the any job, the better job comes often with a lot of temp to perm uh, uh, prop, uh, programs we work with, including our own keys to work. And then the C is when people finally get hired. So our hope is that we, we've been approached by many groups to expand in other states. And I, as the leadership of Recycle Force has made a decision that we're going to stay in Indiana. We'd like to see our model replicated in our state first. And uh, I'll use a line. There's not one criminal justice system in America. There's not 51 criminal justice systems in America. There are 3,000 countywide systems across the country. And it's hard enough to work for me. I'm in Marion County to try to work with Hamilton County or Bartholomew or the other counties in our state. It's very, very complicated. But I think that's the first real step that we want to make at Recycle Force as we begin to expand out. We have a partner with Cook Medical down in Bloomington called Big Boys. They're in the early stages of doing very similar work to what we have. And then we also feel that every single solid waste district in this state is poised to be able to do this work. Last year, the legislature made a decision to expand community service within the solid waste districts and other organizations as well. And that's where folks who owe money to the state for the fines and fees, such as an ankle bracelet or drug testing, can work for free to pay off these debts at these community uh, selected organizations. We don't think it's working very well. One, people need income. They can't work for free. Um, and we think these projects at the federal level and the funding that will be available is what Indiana should be looking at really, really closely here over the next few months as the legislative session comes into uh, to play here. Because we think there's opportunities not only to bring money into the state to help pave the wages of folks in these organizations, but to develop the programming so they can become really solid ways that folks can stay in their communities after they're released. Certainly at Recycle Force, we're seeing a very large movement of individuals being diverted into Marion County or central Indiana uh, where the jobs are. And uh, while that may be good at some level, because we are having a, a very big growing labor market. In fact, I'll say that I've never seen a lab labor market like this in Indiana in my 25 years of doing this for ex-offenders. Uh, I think it's driven one by E-Verify. Number two, it's driven by we're a right to work state and many employers that are here uh, have come here for uh, the type of a uh, lower level, you know, 10 to 15, $16 an hour employee. 
And then I also think COVID in the unemployment insurance has uh, moved some people onto the sidelines temporarily. And so there are individuals rushing from other counties and being diverted here all, all over the state to look for the jobs in pred predominant logistics. Uh, I like to say we're the logistics capital, we're the Silicon Valley of logistics uh, in the United States. We have a lot of uh, that type of work. So bottom line, we feel there's a great need to expand the Recycle Force model across the state. There are groups like the Clubhouse that uh, work with individuals with mental illness, but there's just this timing is right to begin to think very you know, strongly about how we expand into, uh, to, you know, to bring people into our labor force and to really make our work an economic development tool and why we tie in with the work of people like Leslie Wagner and Genovas and their work. So I will pause and uh, turn it back to Cam to introduce Leslie. Thanks, Greg. This is a great oversight uh, of what you're doing. And uh, Leslie, you've been involved with everything from tax incentives to creating government programs at both the local and state level that work to attract capital investment and employers. Uh, and I think Greg's uh, struck upon something very interesting here, which is the, the state of labor markets and particularly the state of uh, the, our workforce in, in Indiana. Uh, it is on the tip of every uh, business leader's tongue what to do and how to train up people. And so with, with that, I just ask you, Leslie, to uh, uh, begin your remarks and, and kind of tell us how a program like this might uh, feed into this system, if you will. Great. Thanks, thanks Cam. And, um, you know, obviously, Kate and Greg, this is what they do day in and, and day out. And I, I think members of our team and folks within our industry as a whole are very glad that you are doing what you're doing. Um, and really that's predicated upon, Cam, you exactly said it, the intense need for, for labor in a lot of the industries that we, we represent. Um, E-commerce being at, at, at the top of, of that list. So, um, you know, one of, from, a, from a site selector's perspective, the leading driver of location decisions is the availability for labor. So by example, we were working with a client that had a new um, distribution need, uh, athletic apparel, uh, to employ 1,200 people. And we, we went and we met with the, the mayor of the community and he looked right at myself and my client and said, we, we don't have the labor to support you in this market. Um, to which, you know, the client responded, "We'll worry about the labor. We need to. We need to have our, our real estate needs um, taken care of." And and so that story is replicated over and over and over again. And so the opportunity to have programming to tap perhaps um, one of the biggest labor markets that there is uh, in the United States, uh, that being ex felons. Um, is, is critically in, important. Um, you know, pre-pandemic, the unemployment rate in the Indianapolis metro area was in the 3% range. And, and that just caused incredible hiring issues um, for a number of our clients. Again, in that logistics business, FedEx supply chain, XBO, uh, Midwest Animal Health, the, the list goes on and on. Um, E-commerce has grown tremendously, which is not um, a secret to any, anyone. Between 1997 and 2016, it grew at an 80% rate at a pandemic onto that, those growth rates. And, um, and, and the employment within the industry is going to continue to be um, very strained. Um, we see that the greatest uh, need for types of positions within e-commerce are customer service reps, shipping and receiving clerks, order fillers. And so this programming, going back to the A, B, and C, a job, a better job, a career, we believe that the logistics industry is perfectly suited 
Um, and, and we know a number of companies that have programs in place uh, to accommodate um, the hiring of ex-felons. And so to have a state continue to support those efforts, I think is a win-win uh, for, for everyone involved. You know, Cam, you had mentioned um, with respect to incentivizing companies and while incentives in, in any project aren't necessarily the number one driver, but the ability to have programming to offset costs associated um, with, with hiring um, ex-felons, uh, will and does go, go a long way. I know that there are federal tax credit programs, the workforce opportunity tax credits that provide um, opportunities for employers to offset costs. Um, I know Indianapolis has embraced, I think they call it the hired program, where if individuals um, uh, from um, ex, ex felons are hired, there's an opportunity for, I, I think, a $2,500 offset. So those programs are, are meaningful and, and go a long way, at least with the companies and clients that we represent. Thank, thanks, Leslie. Um, I think now is the portion of our program where we can open it up for questions from participants, but I, I have a, a couple of my own uh, keying off what, what some of you have said. And Leslie, you just pointed out that just as, uh, like you have real estate uh, or relocation incentives through either tax abatements or uh, the edge credits at, at, at the state of Indiana level. Uh, there is a bit of a, a, a subsidy here. We're talking about subsidized employment or transitional jobs. And even with that subsidy, I, I kind of want to draw out the fact that you're subsidizing and providing incentives for a labor market or a section of the labor market and it's proving cost-effective. So I'm wondering, Kate or, or, or Greg or Leslie, I'll open up the floor if, if, if any of you could speak to, to that. I, I know uh, on the demonstration project, it showed that there was the cost-benefit analysis again was a, a kind of pass-fail and it was, it was passed. But I'd like to dig into that a little bit more. Yeah, I actually think all of the studies that I've seen of transitional jobs, they pass the cost benefit analysis. And I think that's in part because um, the when you consider not just, we've talked about sort of the cost benefit of training versus uh, employment or earnings, but when you also add into um, the value to the community of reduced recidivism, the value of the community to stabilized housing, those sort of are, are, are larger pieces that, um, given the population you're dealing with that also have to be factored in. And, and that's a much bigger benefit than just, than the cost of, of providing the kind of training that Recycle Force is. So I think almost all the evaluations, if not all of them have shown um, that the benefits are larger than the costs. And Kim, I'll jump in here to even add to that, that <clears throat> when do dollars come from the federal government or even foundations and philanthropy, uh, and when we spend those dollars on stipends or other activities that are important to do at many times or just fitting on the trainers that we're hiring, <clears throat> there is not a return back to government. In a transitional job, a wage paying transitional job, <clears throat> there are state taxes paid, there are COA taxes paid. So we're able to turn these dollars back that we will get back into the tax as a part of the tax revenue for the state and the local government. And I think that's an important thing about our model that we're not paying a stipend. We're not giving you know, money out to individuals who desperately need it. We're paying a wage for real work, even though we're, we're designing that work so people can better themselves. I mean, we pay to be able to test for your high school equivalency. We pay for the credential that you may be learning how to do in real time uh, contextually by actually doing it. But I think that's an important part. The governor uh, has not, Indiana has never uh, put out the, the, what they could do is put all 10% of the WIOA allocation toward transitional employment. It's not happened in Indiana as yet. I don't know how Colorado and Wisconsin have funded their operation, but I would bet there's some WIOA uh, money that's been put through uh, WIOA money that's put in there. But I do think it's something for our legislators 
our DWD to begin to think about because wage paying employment does return some amount of those dollars back into the local economy and the state economy. I think it's very important to point that out. So the net effect of the, uh, the initial subsidy is, is uh, lessened because you're generating those tax revenues back. And to point out, it, these are transitional jobs. You're taking them through that, those ABCs, that any job to a better job, to a credential job that leads to a career and sustainable employment. You know, and just to point out the solid waste districts, if they were doing things like this, rather than taking the community service workers, there'd be revenue that would be generated back into the state and local coffers. And uh, so I just think there's a lot of entities out there across the state that could begin to scratch their heads about how they could implement these transitional jobs types programs. Because there's community service people are turning over too. And uh, this way, they can put a more functional program together to be able to turn them over out into the logistics field or other business that can hire from the training that would be conducted uh, by these groups. Hey, Greg, I've, I've got a question, Kim, if you don't mind. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. So as, as the federal government is looking at states to provide funding to, are they also looking at maybe local or foundations that um, are also contributing to help leverage that that further. Um, I, I think about the Lilly Foundation and mm -hmm. opportunities for, you know, those types of contributions, maybe to help position Indiana a little bit better. better. Can you speak to that at all? I'll let Kate start. Yeah. So um, the 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 one bill that's out there, right? So Senator Baldwin's bill actually would allow. Uh, part of it is a is a grant program to the state. There's also a competitive grant program to local to local uh, governments. And that one does look very specifically at partnerships. Like you'd sort of get more points if you were partnering with a foundation, if there was more community buy-in or you were leveraging local dollars. I suspect, you know, it's being legislation, it's not really detailed we spelled out, but even the state one does say um, it, it will require in better economic terms, a match and it allows for sort of the leveraging of local philanthropy, um, other other forms of, of um, funding for that for that match program. So they do try to encourage. I think through that they are trying to encourage, um, not just like a drop of state dollars, but a state local philanthropic, you know, community wide buy in to support this kind of a program. Does that answer? Yeah, it does. Makes makes sense. And I can add that the Lilly Endowment now for the <clears throat> for the first time is really looking strongly at poverty. There was a study done by the Brookings Institute that has got us really looking at what are the root causes of poverty and how can we begin to mitigate uh, those issues. They're deep, they're complicated, and the federal government or government, local, state, or federal, and philanthropy even combined, it's still, these are huge lifts that have to be done. But I'm really proud. We've, we've been argued for a number of years that one of the root causes of poverty is the criminal justice system itself. When you're removing people from, you know, from families and incarcerating them, we, we lose their income generating ability, the families lose parents, uh, businesses lose employees. And while certainly we, there's a role for uh, jail and prison and uh, we're not going to do away with them, we've cast the net awfully wide in the United States and Indiana specifically. And as we begin to bend that curve ever so slightly and bring these folks back in um, into society, we think the philanthropic community along with government uh, have really major roles to play. And as a part of that transitional employment or subsidized employment is we think the most underutilized tool in the state right now and we're, why we're really holding this brown bag today is to begin to get some dialogue talking about this. Because as Kate mentioned, there's going to be a stimulus package of some sort. When ARA happened, it kind of sailed over the top of Indiana. And I'm hoping we can begin to uh, think deeply here, our legislative leaders, about what can we really do so that all the money doesn't end up in Wisconsin or Colorado or California or New York, historically where these federal dollars go, that Indiana rightly can get our fair share and can build our economy and build in a way that's appropriate for the type of labor we have specifically this logistics field. Amazon is building a 2 million square foot facility. 
So is Walmart. There's going to be a lot of jobs learning how to operate forklifts. The certified logistics associate that we all train on is going to be big for our future. And of all the industries right now you know, that have been favorable to uh, people coming home from prison, the logistics field has been the most favorable. Again, as I said earlier, I've never had this much openings in my 25 years of doing this work for uh, former, you know, for offender friendly employers. Leslie, Thanks for I, the question, Leslie. <laughs> yeah, Le Leslie, can I ask you to unpack a little bit of what Greg just said there and what are the credentials that uh, those industries, uh, particularly in, in logistics, you know, you, you mentioned e-commerce and it's spectacular growth. Well, the E is what we all do when we sit in front of our computers. The commerce happens when you fulfill and then you have to you know, change out orders, et, et, et cetera. What, what, what is that industry looking for in terms of credentials and are programs like uh, Recycle Force and the other programs being studied by this, this demonstration program, uh, are, is there an alignment between the, the, uh, the skill sets and certifications and, and what you're seeing in, in the marketplace? Yeah, absolutely. And, and the skill sets are continuing to, to change. So, you know, back in 2007, when I started working for Genovis, the logistics industry looked quite different than it, than it looks today, um, you know, in terms of automation. So um, we're seeing um, an increase in automation um, in, in most distribution facilities. However, there are still um, entry level positions that um, in, in our minds would be very well suited for entry level people, you know, re-entering post in incarceration and coming out of the uh, recycle force type, type projects. Um, so an actual certification may not be needed, but I think that logistics certifications are outcomes that as a person is building a career could certainly be something to, to aspire to. Job, job classifications are wide ranging within the logistics business. Everything from running the facility in its totality to um, packing and filling and, and order taking and customer service and forklift lift drivers and you know, RF scan specialists, um, you know, the list is, is very broad based. The, the challenge that most clients that we work with is, is, is having some of those entry level position, uh, positions available to, to be filled. Um, there is such a competitive nature, such, such competition for that level of worker today. So if we can generate more of them, if we can grow that, that workforce, it continues. Um, it will allow continuation of Indiana to, to satisfy the needs of all of the e-commerce centers that wanna be here because the business environment is so positive, because logistically we're very well situated. We have great infrastructure. The challenge is we need a skilled workforce in order to uh, meet the demand. We're, we're just completing a, a project now. It's a million square foot. Um, it will be another nine to 1100 workers. Where are those workers going to come from? So can I just add, um, so underscore yeah. what Leslie said and, and tie it to what Greg had talked about that, uh, employment social enterprises and transitional job programs like Recycle Force, right? They do provide that, that base training to then and have the entry level folks that um, Leslie's clients need. But he also talked about how they provide credentials, right? So the credential is an added piece on top of it. So you'll get your entry level person, but with the pot potential to do a higher level work eventually, right? And so you, that's the benefit for the employer who needs that labor and also for the employee who maybe is gonna end up with a more of a quality job as a result. So they, in a way that, you know, just starting uh, might not provide the same level of, of training, something like an employment social enterprise is gonna give training and, and a credential. So I think it's, uh, it's worth mentioning that. We find too that a lot of employers um, feel very strongly about committing to this social social cause. So working very hard to have those entry level uh, people continue on a, on a path because they're committed to kind of doing the right thing, if you will. 
you know, at being the uh, Silicon Valley of logistics also makes this the Silicon Valley for retail returns or product that is yeah. cuts yeah. back. And that's a big product stream for recycle force. And we're diverting that material that might've gone into our landfills. Uh, one reason it, we're the, the center of logistics is our location, the Crossroads of America. But we also happen historically to have some of the cheaper tipping fees uh, of other states. So in the past, companies could just throw away this material into our landfill. Today, that's changing. Companies are wanting to see that material recycled and recycled back into the uh, manufacturing stream. So there are these secondary work that like Recycle Force does, the impact that we'll have on our on municipalities and the waste that, that comes in this way. So there's a lot of industry that's created around logistics and um, the products that come in and out of the state on a huge, huge amount of stuff. Curling irons, hair dryers, you name it. These are the things that um, we it can create uh, revenue for us in a, a, a training component and how you learn to, to drive the reach trucks, how you learn to do inventory control, because we have to monitor some of the same inventory procedures these big logistics firms have. Medical equipment, we've got a lot of these type of uh, operations here that we're training, we're handling their material, but we're also training workers for their expansions. That's excellent, Greg. Uh, at this point, I'd like to open the floor and see if we have any questions from our, our audience and uh, see if there's any in the queue, Mr. Galvin. If not, I'm not seeing any uh, pop up on the screen here. So I wanna, I wanna return to the, 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 the steady state and something you said, Greg, struck me and marrying it to what Leslie said about the, the, the tightness of the job market and the competition amongst employers for trained people. That, that tells me that supply and demand wages are gonna increase. And the faster you move someone who's returning into civil society into a, a, a paying job, the, the faster their life is going to turn around. You said, Greg, we, we don't just do recycling, we recycle lives. And so bringing that first job and then moving them on through those ABC steps to get their, their lives back on track, that has to have a strong positive effect on recidivism. And I'd like to maybe have you unpack where we are right now with recidivism. If there's no recycle force out there, or no transitional job program, what, what, what are those statistics? Because I, in doing some research for today, they struck me as being r rather harrowing. Uh -huh. they're, they're very, very high. And, and I will say, before I go into some, the, the dire numbers, that his, you know, Indianapolis is making some really major changes. Our prosecutor, our mayor, our, our local folks have really begun to bend the curve on, on that, but historically, without a recycle force, uh, and I can only speak for Marion County, I think the state is very similar and across the country is probably very similar. But historically, 70% of the people who were returned to prison from Indianapolis did not commit a new crime. They had a technical rule violation of their oversight requirements upon release. And we feel predominantly it was because of the lack of income. So if you have to pay for your ankle bracelet at $85 a week and you don't and you don't have the income to pay for that, that can become a technical rule violation. If you don't have the money to pay for your random drug drop, that's nine to $13 each time you have to take that test, that can lead to a technical rule violation. With some oversight, simply not obtaining employment can be deemed as if the court has ordered you to get a job and you can't get one. These can be uh, technical rule violations. So again, historically, seven out of 10 people who went back to the state of Indiana's Department of Correction did not commit a new crime. They simply could not manage the mandates that were placed upon them uh, upon release. And that's really the reason we created what we've created so that people could earn and learn. So they'd have an, you know, a fighting chance to be able to make it. And what we've discovered is the vast majority of people want to work, can work, but we have to be able to manage the oversight and the public safety that's being placed on them. And um, when we first entered this, we watched the vast majority of people, probably the smartest thing you could do from a certain place was to sell drugs. 
Selling drugs allowed you to have the money to pay your fines and fees. And they didn't require you to be anywhere from eight to, you know, on a, on a regular shift. And so we watched for some time uh, in previous administrations where we would see people sell drugs to pay for their ankle bracelet or this material. That's changed, I'm yeah. happy to say, today where it's far less, it, it still happens, but it's happening far less because we've got some uh, really progressive thinking uh, with our prosecutor, especially in oversight, many of the judges, and I really believe Recycle Force deserves a lot of that credit of being able to work with the criminal justice system here in Marion County to point that out that it was happening. And we think a little bit of the changes are, are a result of pointing that out. But if we can begin to do these type of programs, you know, there are 8,000 people that come from DOC alone into Marion County every year. If we cycle for its quadruples, we're still not even at 20% of that number. So Goodwill is a big part of this work now in Indianapolis. We've got Project Leah. We've got many in the in the in uh, the county beginning to look at our model, but we're also hoping now we can look statewide and get other groups uh, like the clubhouse, like the solid waste districts involved uh, in replicating this model because we think it can have a profound impact on the cost of prison and jail for counties. And state, there's no, very few county in that uh, in this state are not looking at the cost of their jail, where they have to build new jails. They're outsourcing uh, people to other counties with more space. So the 1006, uh, Greg Stewart-Walt's legislation, 1006 has changed criminal justice systems here. And we think there's still, I'm a big fan of 1006. It just needs to be implemented in a way that it's more work-based and that's not quite happened at the level I think was envisioned when it was first passed. And I'm getting in the weeds on the 1006, but hopefully there's a few people out there that will appreciate that. <laughs> well, well, let's segue. We do have a couple of questions here. Uh, I'll take them in order. Uh, Jay Brubaker is touching upon here with his question uh, of, of a population that you, you mentioned uh, several minutes ago, Greg. He currently has 10 clubhouses in the state of Indiana with two more in development that provide transitional employment for folks uh, recovering from serious mental illness uh, without any state or, or, or federal support. Is there a potential for expanding this type of funding to that population as well versus the, the, the returning uh, uh, felons? Yeah, so why don't I talk real briefly about federal dollars? Um, yeah, thanks, Kate. Sure. So the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act, your primary source of workforce, sort of public workforce dollars that comes into the state, there's an opportunity. Currently, there's an allowability to set aside 10%. I think Greg mentioned this earlier, 10% of the administrator dollars can be set aside for transitional jobs, solely for transitional jobs. So if the state of Indiana did that now, that funding could be used for any transitional jobs in the state, whether they were for incar formerly incarcerated individuals, uh, individuals with serious mental illness, it wouldn't matter the population that has a serious barrier, just anyone with a barrier. The proposals for um, a federal subsidized employment package, whether it be in a recovery act or in a separate standalone bill are similar that they would provide funding for transitional jobs, regardless of as long as the person had the folks involved in the program had barriers to employment, it wouldn't matter what the barriers. Uh, the largest set of folks with barriers tend to be formerly incarcerated individuals, but that is not a mandatory requirement. It, it would be anybody with, with a barrier. And I'll just add to, to Mr. Rubacher, the, the simple answer is yes. Uh, a special organization that have this much reach across the state, like Goodwill does, like Solid Waste Districts does, that we're looking for organizations that have multiple locations that can begin to expand this. So, uh, Mr. Brubacher, the simple answer, yes. Good. We, we have another question here from, from Tom Orr. Uh, can the panel comment on the equity dimension of this work and whether they are seeing more transparency in hiring and advancement within firms targeted by transitional job programs? In other words, is for instance, is the culture changing in, in the logistics industry, or is there still a uh, reluctance to, to engage with these types of programs? Leslie, do, do you have any idea? Yeah, that, that's, a, that, that's a great question. Um, I, I think that there is an increase in companies to being receptive to hiring transitional employees. Now, it, it may not be applicable 
um, in, in all instances. And I think it is somewhat dependent upon, um, you know, client protocols that, for instance, a third party logistics provider might have with, with their clients. But um, absolutely, because of the extreme pressure on the labor market, um, and also um, companies' social interest in doing good things um, that, that we're seeing more receptivity to, to hiring their, the transitional folks. I mean, there's a number of very well-known companies throughout the U.S. that make um, um, formerly incarcerated people a part of their hiring policy whether that's Amazon or UPS or Walmart or Coca-Cola or Pepsi, there's, there's a lot of companies that are embracing this. And um, what we'd like to see is more Indiana companies um, getting, behind, uh, getting behind it as well. And, and I'll just add that it, it's, it's uh, noticeable the changes that logistics has made as compared to other industries that have been a little bit more reluctant. The Indiana has passed negligent hire protection for employers. We don't think that's had the impact it could because many of the insurance companies are not based in Indiana and it is specific for Indiana based insurance companies. But as we just begin to look at protections um, for employers that hire from this population, we think that logistics for at least for our region is uh, perfect. And the racial equity aspect of this uh, has been quite, quite noticeable to us. Uh, in our work here over the last 25 years. Terrific, and uh, I want to uh, thank everyone. We uh, promised to be uh, out of here at, uh, at 1 p.m. The hour is upon us. I wanna thank uh, Kate, Greg, and Leslie for participating today. We have recorded this uh, uh, brown bag session. So if you have friends, uh, that want to see this, please reach out to us. We'd be happy to share it. If you want to refresh uh, or have a record of it for your own self, you can visit it as well. And I'm absolutely certain that uh, Kate would be more than willing to share uh, her findings uh, about the, uh, the program with you and that Greg would be more than happy to give you a tour recycle force. And I know Leslie is always interested in, in talking to people and their needs and the economic development realm. So uh, thank you all again for participating today. Uh, we hope you found it uh, informative and uh, let's hope that uh, more smart public policy like this comes to the fore in the very near future. Thank you all. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Yeah, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Take care.